What's going on, everybody? We are live with the Human Proof Designs broadcast inside of the private Facebook group that we have here. Today, we are with Chris Parker from whatismyipaddress.com. I think, I guarantee you, somebody listening to this podcast, uh, well, would have been on your site. So welcome, Chris. Thank you. It's great to be here. This is this is the man behind the machine. We'll we'll call it. Hey guys, <laughs> um, Chris, where are you anyways right now? I'm located in uh, Southern California, about halfway between LA and San Diego. Very cool, very cool. Um, tell us a little bit about what is my IP address.com, if it's not obvious. <laughs> well, it tells you your IP address. No. <laughs> so the, the primary use of what is my IP address.com is, you know, is to actually tell people what their IP address is. And you might go, well, don't people know that? And the answer usually is if you're inside your own network, you actually don't know what your public facing IP address is. And so our website gives people the ability to be able to see that and uh, see some information about that, like what their ISP is, uh, where they're located, and uh, throws it on a map. Okay, very cool. How, how did you start this site? So it originally started uh, as a solution to a technical problem that I was having at a company that I was working for. Uh, like like the, the site name says, I was trying to find out the IP address of the company internet connection. And this was uh, back in pre-Google days. And so I was on, uh, oh, maybe it was Alta Vista or Lycos trying to find, uh, doing a search to result for a website that would give me that information. And there really wasn't a site that I could find easily. And so I thought, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a geek. I've gotten, in, I've gotten always on internet connection at home and a few extra boxes. Let me put together a website that does that. And so I thought, well, what should I call it? What is my IP address.com? That sounds good enough. Answers the question. And so very simple code. People went to the website. It just showed them their IP address. No banners, no ads, no links, no content. Just, you know, about 15 characters. <laughs> How long ago was this? Uh, that was back in 2000. It's been uh, just over 19 years now. And uh, congrats. Thank you. Almost just about time for the 20 year anniversary party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I guess you'll go with your wife to Paris or something like that. For that. I, you know, that sounds like a great idea. I'll suggest that to her. <laughs> it, it's on our bucket list. Awesome. Um, so tell me about the beginning of this website. Uh, because well, at least in a lot of our audience is mostly uh, search engine people, SEO people. So in their eyes, wow, that is a, that's an exact match domain if I've ever heard one. Yep. But I don't think that you actually went in thinking that. So tell me a little bit about the beginning of the site and how that all got started. Yeah, like I was saying, it was it was I was never planning on starting this up as a business. It wasn't. Uh, you know, oh, I've got this great business model. I'll, I'll tell people their IP addresses. I'll throw ads on it. I'll throw links on it to affiliate programs. I was kind of uh, very far away from where I originally started the site. It was totally a hobby. You know, after putting the site up, I thought, oh, you know, people probably have questions. Let me put an email address on there so people can ask me questions. And uh, so I started, you know, evenings and weekends responding to the every now and then question. And started seeing that, gee, a lot of these questions are just the same question over and over and over and over again. And I don't want to copy and paste the same answer. How about if I just put a, uh, some facts up on the site? And so that was the, the genesis of the content was starting to fill out and answer those questions. People are asking, well, how do I change my IP address? Okay, well, if, you're, if you've got a router, here's how you do it. If your computer's connected straight to the internet, here's how you do it. If you know, you're on a, well, Cell phones didn't exist then, but you know a number of different techniques. If you're on Windows, if you're on on Mac, here's how you go about doing it. Okay, you know what can people find out about me from my IP address? Oh, a little bit of content around that. Or how do I hide my IP address? Because I don't want people. I don't want people to know what my IP address was. And that was a later piece of content that led into affiliate marketing. Um, but it was just just trying to be helpful and add content and thoroughly answer questions that people had. And I think that's what. Uh, initially really helped the site to do well, which because it was, you know, purely beneficial content, no ads, no nothing. 
And people would just naturally, in the early days of the internet, link to useful information much more uh, judicious or much more friendly so than people do now. How did people find your website? Uh, you know, at the beginning, the early days of the internet, it was a matter of initially going out to all the directories, DMOs, Yahoo. You know, these weren't these weren't websites; they were uh, human curated directories. Some of them were pay for submission, uh, you know, pay 20 bucks, 50 bucks, 100 bucks. And so I think that was kind of the start of the genesis was making sure that I was in all those directories at the beginning. And as search engines were coming online, making sure that I figured out where the submit your URL link was and, and got it submitted to the search engines. These days, search engines are much easier at discovering content. You don't have to tell them where it is. If it exists, and one person links to it from somewhere in the world, even if no one links to it, it uh, very frequently gets indexed very quickly. Back in the old days, it was 30, 60, 90 days from the time that uh, you submitted a page to when it might actually show up or actually might even get updated. <laughs> um, this might be a small tangent, but I'm going to ask it anyways because I uh -huh. think it's awesome. The So being a search engine nerd, when you started this website, I think there were about 19 search engines that started before Google came mm -hmm. about. Sounds did about any, right. Did any of those search engines stick out to you and you thought, oh, this is gonna be this is gonna be a good this is gonna be the one before I Google? I don't know, like at the time, I don't think anyone ever even thought of there's gonna be this one dominant player in search. Um, I, I think you had it was a lot more that you had search engines that were good at different things. Uh, you might have a, a search engine that was good at surfacing technical articles and things like that. One that was good at, they seem to be more niche than they are today in terms of, well, I know this one is good at this type of results. This one's good at that type of results. So depending on what you're searching for, you'd use a different search engine because you knew one would be better than the other in that area. Obviously being uh, Bing and, uh, and Google are pretty consistent about what they surface and maybe they prioritize it a little different, but uh, the ability to index the internet has uh, significantly changed uh, from the old days. Awesome. Uh, so how does, what is my IP address? How does, what, what is, how does the site make money? Yep. So there's, um, Two two main ways the site makes money, and the one was the first that I started doing, which was display ads. I was initially working with a company I think called Fast Click at the time, where there was a little 468 by 60 banner at the top or the bottom of the page, or both at that time, that uh, they would they would find the advertisers and pay me you know a couple cents a, a click or a couple cents a page view. Uh, that uh, moved into Google AdSense which was a, a much nicer, easier, set it and forget it type of thing. Uh, Go when Google started dealing with AdWords, they really started um, getting a ton of advertisers very quickly. So it was easy to make, you know, easy to make quite a bit of money. There's, you know, funny jokes of uh, the most expensive uh, search phrase or search word to have on your page was mesothelioma, which is the condition that you get uh, the cancer that you get due to asbestos exposure. And so people were building pages, mesothelioma, mesothelioma, mesothelioma. So they get these really expensive, you know, $10 per click ads on their page. You know, <laughs> that doesn't work anymore. <laughs> um, but so prom uh, predominantly uh, started out with uh, banner ads and there's a couple of different flavors of doing things. And uh, one of the first affiliate programs that I joined was go to my PC, which seemed to be a natural uh, connection with my website. People are trying to find out their IP address. Maybe they're trying to connect to their machine at home when they're away. This would be a, a, a great product to promote. And so I little 88 by 31 banner ad on the page uh, that just said, go to my PC and people would click on it and I'd make a, a couple bucks every time someone signed up for the product. And that was kind of like the, oh, you know what, I can actually really start making some good money off of this site, not just from affiliate programs, but by providing useful content and getting beyond just those facts. Very cool. Um, what, 
if you can kind of think of milestones for your site in terms of revenue, uh, how would you break it down? Um, I, I think probably the first milestone was I made enough money to pay my internet bill. <laughs> Back in the day, you know, a, a 1.5 megabit DSL connection was, uh, or synchronous DSL connection was, I don't know, two, three hundred dollars a month or something like that. So, to me, once I started to actually be able to pay my internet bills, it was like, wow, this is this is kind of cool. Um, you know, I think from there, you know, the first thousand dollar month was was pretty cool. Uh, once it started getting to the point where it was enough money to at the end of the day to take a vacation and go somewhere once a year uh, was a, was a milestone. Uh, $10,000 a month was a milestone. $100,000 a year uh, was a milestone. And probably the more, uh, there's, there's, there's a big milestone coming up soon, but I think one of the more recent milestones was that uh, ability for me to transition from it being a side hustle to being a, a full-time job that uh, my, my full-time employer was struggling financially. and was like, well, we can't, we can't afford to keep you on. Um, we're going to have to let you go. So my wife and I talked as well. Can I make enough continuing to grow the site above uh, above and beyond where it currently was at? Uh, or you know, can I keep growing the site, or should I just get another day job and have that be the primary source of my income? And so we we set up some milestones even within that of like, okay, let's look at thirty days, let's look at ninety days, and let's look at a year if I can hit certain. Uh, earning numbers within those time frames, then yeah, it's a viable option for for this to be a full time job. Uh, and that was about five years ago. Obviously, I I, I hit those milestones, um, and it's it's a blast working from home and not having to to live according to somebody else's schedule. And uh, I think the next milestone that I'm striving to hit, and hopefully I'll hit it this year, is a million dollar year. Nice, nice. Well, hopefully we can somehow try to get you there. I don't know how, but, <laughs> but you're on the site. I mean, everybody on the, on the internet, just go there and click on one ad. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah, everyone go to what's my IP address and go to specifically <laughs> his, uh, which, you know, actually that's a good point. So you, you do have competitors, right? Yeah, there are, um, there have been a number of competitors over time. I think, uh, right now there's one other site that has probably about the similar amount of traffic, uh, that I have. They launched, I think they launched about a year or within a year of when I did before I did. And so we've kind of been, they've been number one for a while. I've been number one for a while. There have been a few people that have uh, risen up through the search results due to kind of black hat techniques and taken that number one spot in terms of traffic and then fallen by the wayside. Uh, so I really have one in terms of traffic wise, one significant competitor. There's definitely probably three or four people out there with about half the traffic that I have. And then there's probably about a million other sites that will tell you, they tell you your IP address. So in some sense, it is really competitive in terms of it, it's something that anybody could put up a site that actually tells people that. So it's in some sense, it's a commodity uh, with the, what is my IP address aspect of it, but it's hard to break through. I think at this point, it's really probably very hard to break through the search results to get into the top five these days just based off of longevity um, i've been around almost 20 years the other guys have been around 20 years um, where i do see uh, more what i look at as a more competitive thing is when i'm trying to compete on affiliate offers and compete in a, a an online privacy and security vertical there's definitely a lot more competition there's people with significant budgets for advertising that i'm trying to compete with in that space but the ip address space um, I, I'm near the near the front end of that line, so it's it's worked really well. So you left your job when the site was about 14 years old, I believe. Correct. <laughs> That's a while. <laughs> yes, this this by no means was a uh, a huge success overnight. Um, not to say that I wasn't making a, a fair amount of money. Um, probably for the maybe, you know, five, seven years before that, there was a decent amount of money coming in. I personally and my wife are both somewhat risk averse. And it was, I wasn't confident that if I quit my day job, I could double or triple the income on the website. So it was, well, if I could have a, a full-time job revenue and a side gig 
that generates a full-time job worth of revenue, hey, that's that's nice. If the economy does bad, I'm not left holding the bag. It's kind of that uh, not putting all the eggs in one basket mentality. Um, so you don't regret transitioning to your full-time or transitioning this to a full-time uh, career, we'll call it, uh, earlier? Um, I think there are times that I do regret it, that I thought, well, gosh, if I had, I mean, if I look back at it now and said, well, if I had applied all the techniques that I'm doing now, if I'd applied those 20 years ago, you know, maybe I could be retired by now. But, um, you know, I think each person is on their own journey and you've got to decide, each person has to decide their own risk tolerance. If you've got a family and kids, you might not have the opportunity to quit your day job as, as early because there's just a larger dependence on your income. Um, or if you're more risk averse like I was, yeah, you, you'd, you'd rather have that safety net of having both going on at the same time. Um, having made that switch, I don't regret having made the switch. I really enjoy uh, working from home, like I said. Yeah, I probably could have done it a couple years sooner, but uh, it's worked out the way it's worked out and you can't go back and change the past. Absolutely not. What did the site look like when you, uh, when you left your job and we, during the transition, what was the, What did the site look like? You mean cosmetically or uh, makeup of content or let's talk about traffic wise and, and maybe even revenue wise. Um, so I think at the time that I left, my job, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me. It's probably about half the revenue uh, that it is now. So it's definitely grown the revenue significantly in the last couple of years. Um, but I've also grown my expenses an awful lot in the last couple of years as well. Um, you know, I have contractors writing for me. I have graphic artists. Uh, you know, when I make podcast appearances, I have people that transcribe that for me that I uh, recently hired a business coach. And so there's you know, a, a variety of things that have significantly increased expenses. I've had denial of service attacks against the site over the years that have taken me down for days or weeks at a time. And I've bit the bullet in uh, doing denial of service mitigation, which can be, uh, which can be very expensive because I know that, well, if the site's down for a week, Google at some point is going to slap me for that. And while that particular outage maybe cost me less revenue than what I spent on the annual cost on, on of uh, denial of service protection. If my site were to fall out of the index entirely, then there's a large portion of my income gone. So it's kind of a looked at it as insurance and keeping the site up, but along with, uh, along with providing a good user experience. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think by having uh, 40 hours a week to work on the site and, that consistency of like, okay, how do I make this a little bit better? How do I make this a little bit better? Uh, time and effort that I could expend on uh, running tests, running A-B tests, looking at well, how can I make, how can I get this converting a little bit better? Um, what other ad, you know, what other ad networks can I start working with? When, when you're at home, you can actually start taking phone calls from people. <laughs> when, when you're working at another job, uh, your, your boss doesn't like it when you, oh, hold on a second. Let me take this phone call. It's an opportunity. It's a revenue opportunity for my website. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are certain things that are just hard to do when you have a, when you have a daytime job. And so being able to do those during the day, I think really helped accelerate the growth because I was available to make those calls, take those calls and, or even be willing to accept them at all. During that, during that period when you are about to essentially take that first step into entrepreneurship, which is very interesting considering that the site was already generating a, a pretty healthy amount I think people would be, would be happy with. But um, so when you took that first step and you looked at your site kind of from, um, you know, from all different angles, where did you see the improvements that you could have made? Uh, like, you know, what was the game plan going in? I mean, the game plan going in on making that transition was there was a lot of opportunity for me to write or work with writers to create more content for the website and better content, more thoughtful content, content where there's been more re uh, more keyword research done and content uh, related to uh, affiliate products that we could market that were a good fit for users on the site. And so I, part of it was, you know, the, the, the display revenues there, 
I think the big opportunity in the last couple of years has really been the affiliate revenue to be able to find uh, products and services that are related to some aspect of why the person is using the site and really being able to make a good case of here's a good product. This will solve this will solve these types of needs good for these types of situations and be able to present uh, one or more affiliates within that space. Was it just content then? Was that a, was that essentially the first thing that you you kind of wanted to knock out, or were there any other things beyond that? Definitely have built new tools on the website. Uh, you know, programming a tool is something that takes uh, more time and effort. That uh, a little harder to do on the nights and weekends when you're a little bit distracted. So that gave me the the freedom to invest the time and effort to build something that might be unique, that might be particularly functional, or something that one of my competitors was doing that I didn't have. Um, and there's something else and I just lost it. <laughs> uh, maybe affiliate stuff, I guess that would have been uh, some opportunities there, but you, you did mention that previously. Yeah. What, um, well, I, this wasn't one of the questions that I put on there, but it's completely fine because I'm sure you can answer it. But uh, uh, you talked about content and content processes are really interesting, at least for me, and I think for a lot of people in our audience. Um, I'm always saying that, uh, you know, if you're gonna pick a niche, uh, which I guess you kind of pick a niche, you picked a niche by by random in a sense, but but if you're gonna methodically think about uh, building a, a publishing business, which is uh, what people are doing uh, mostly in the audience here, uh, you know, I kind of tell them, hey, you know, try and find something that's really easily outsourced. Um, you know, because because you'll 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 have a better time finding writers. Even though there's a lot of writers, you'll just find better content. In your experience, has it been easy finding writers for a topic that is as technical as yours? And no, that's actually that's actually been a uh, been a problem, and one of the reasons why content is is more expensive for me probably than a lot of other people is that not only do we have technical content. But we're trying to make technical contact content understandable for people who aren't technical. So I have to have someone who 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 a writer that either understands the technical or that I can explain it to, and then, then they can turn around, dumb it down is not the right phrase, but simplify it and make it, you know, try to remove all the the technical techno babble in it. And so that's it's actually been a challenge to be able to find people who can who can write in that manner. How have you been trying to attack that issue so far? Um, I've, I've tested probably 20 or 30 different writers. <laughs> and I now have three or four that I work with and an editor who's really good at taking the complicated and making it easy, trying to make sure there's a consistency in voice because every writer writes a little bit differently. And we don't want users of the site to be going, uh, that that doesn't feel right, or that doesn't that doesn't phrase things the way the site normally phrases things. And so, the editor helps make sure that there's this nice consistent voice. That if something, he he's he's got a good ability to be able to say, well, when you're technical and you read something that's supposed to be technical and it's kind of kind of is kind of isn't, you can read into it kind of your background and your knowledge. And anyone who's well-versed in a, in a subject will kind of go, oh, I know what they're talking about. They're trying to say this. But he's got a really good ability to be able to, to read and say, well, without having all that background knowledge, does this make sense? And so he's been very helpful in that respect. That certainly makes sense. Um, to find these writers, are you going on to like uh, freelancer marketplaces? Are you going to um writer job boards are you going into are, like are you posting jobs up are you you know are you reaching out to people posting on medium you know how, where, where are you finding these people to, to kind of fill these needs for yourself so a long time ago uh i used uh, textbroker.com i think it was called textbroker i don't use them anymore um some of them have been people that have I'm I'm kind of leery about people that approach me. I probably get one or two people a day approaching me saying, "Hey, I'd really like to write for your site. Uh, I know all about balloons," <laughs> and I'm like, "Well, my site has nothing to do with balloons. Uh, you know, I don't even respond to." Or I'm an ex I'm an expert on all subject matter. No, you're not. And so I get a lot of uh, throwaway people trying to 
you know, usually it's they're trying to write for SEO to get links back to their own site and stuff like that. Um, but occasionally I do have people, um, it was not too long ago, approached by someone who had uh, worked in cybersecurity for 20 years and had just retired. And he was just looking to give back some of the knowledge that he had learned over his career. And it was like, hey, can I write for you like once a month? I don't, I don't need any links. I don't need a byline or anything like that. I just want to... I want to keep active and I want to be in, I, want, I just want to be current. And I said, well, you know, I, usually with these things I go, and I assume that they're kind of lying to me. And it's like, well, you know, what would you like to write about? And I generally don't offer them that because I want to see, are they familiar with what my site is about? Um, have they even done the research? Because some of them will come back and say, oh yeah, uh, I know I'm writing for what is my IP address.com. I'm going to write about dogs. Well, okay, obviously you don't understand. Um, but this guy came back and said, hey, I, here's a couple of topics I could write on. Um, how about I start with this one? I said, okay, yeah, send it over to me. And he sent it over. It's like, wow, this is actually really nicely written. Had my editor look at it. He was really happy about it. So I've had a number of people start writing for me just because they've approached me. Um, there's other people that I've seen them writing somewhere else and approached them and said, hey, would you like to... Would you like to write for me? Can I pay you to write for me? Uh, and then I've had a number of referrals of, hey, I know someone who can write about this for you. And I've generally had better results with referrals from other people more than I have job postings or uh, soliciting guest posts. Usually it's referrals for me. Very interesting, very interesting. The, uh, I mean, I really like that just because there's, yeah, I mean, we talk about you know finding a subject to to, to build your site around that's that's easily outsourced. But of course, whenever you kind of go through those hurdles, to I mean, to do the outreach, ask for the referrals, you are building a moat around your business yeah. with the team that you have. Um, were you were you were you editing content at the very beginning yourself? Um, at the very beginning, at the very very beginning, I was writing. Um, and then for stuff that I was less familiar with or didn't want to write out, write about, I would go out to a fairly inexpensive service, um, you know, have someone write it for five bucks or 10 bucks. Um, if the page did well in terms of drawing traffic, I would potentially go back in and edit. And if it continued to do well, I'd very often go back and have a more experienced writer just entirely rewrite the article making sure we're still talking about the same thing, but rewrite it so that it's better. And, and we still go back and do that on a regular basis. We look at trap, we look at uh, content and say, Hey, what, you know, it's been a year since we've looked at this content. What can we do to make it cleaner? What can we do to make it to clarify things that maybe have changed a little bit or just things that we have learned of like, Oh gosh, we've really missed out, you know, in, in, in an article trying to be authoritative, we've really missed out on, this and that let's make sure we include that or there's just new terminology that people are using so we need to update you know, kind of update it for keywords and stuff like that where did you learn all this stuff by doing it <laughs> that's what you get over 20 over 20 years of practice um i think i've probably learned a lot in terms of coming back and rewriting the articles or my editor coming back and rewriting articles i hired a uh a business coach who also is uh, well known in SEO, Stefan Spencer, and he's really given us just a uh, a fire hose worth of uh, things that we need to look at when we're writing ideas. Are we are we using all the related words when you're talking about? Let's say you're talking about mowing your lawn. Are you talking about grass clippings? Are you talking about? Um, I don't know. Uh, allergies, you know, all the things that are tangentially related to that content to make sure that Google sees that, yes, this is an authoritative topic about this because they're mentioning all the appropriate phrases and usage material, you know, kind of all that usage uh, linguistics around it. Right. So trying to cover the whole the whole topic really yep. in, in a single piece of content. Yeah. And moving away from the, the 600 word content to the three to 4,000 word content. Do you have a system that, uh, do you have a system right now in place for, 
for updating that content? Like, do you have signals that tell you, I think we should be working on this piece of uh, old content? I, I don't have a system in place. I do periodically kind of review what pages are generating ad revenue, what pages are generating traffic and looking back at it and saying, well, is this something that, you know, maybe it was written a couple of years ago. Is there, is there a call to action that we could add to move them to some other place on the site? Is there an affiliate product now related to this that we might be able to talk about? And sometimes, you know, there's definitely times we've gone back and looked at content and went, wow, that's, that's really bad. We just need to remove it from the site altogether because it doesn't meet our standards anymore. Or it's like, well, we just, we just need to rewrite it. So it's, we, we kind of, kind of work through it, but is there a, a clearly defined documented process for reviewing existing content? No. Maybe there should be. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so, you know, your site is pretty old at the time when you are, it's about 14 years old when you're, you are starting to, to get, uh, well, whenever you take the dive and start putting on content on there. Did you notice that it was easier for you to rank for these maybe more difficult keywords because of the authority that your your website already had? Yeah, that was kind of one of the revelations a, a number of years ago was uh, I could write about anything that was tangentially related to IP addresses, link to it from our homepage, and it would rank in the top five search results pretty consistently. So that has been part of the, the logic of like, okay, we need to use this authority to start ranking for more and more keywords, more phrases, more concepts that are tangentially related and not, I think initially it was like, well, I just want to talk about IPv4 addresses, IPv6 addresses, changing IP addresses, hiding IP addresses, and starting to branch out and have a wider reach of content that's not always uh, so closely tied, but it still makes sense that it's related. Okay. Do does most of your traffic come to the homepage? Yeah, probably about half of the the incoming traffic comes into the homepage at this point. What do you do to get people to not leave? <laughs> um, that has been the, 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 probably the biggest difficulty in terms of that, that homepage content because people are specifically coming there. I'm just here to get my IP address and leave. I'm not here to do research. I'm not here to educate myself. I'm not here to figure out what the best product to buy is. I'm here for my IP address and I'm gone. Um, so we've tried to draw more attention to well, what does that IP address reveal about you? Um, we've actually probably gone overboard in things that you can do and things that you can see on the homepage in an attempt to get people to go other places on the site and try other tools. Uh, we're actually just gearing up to start A-B testing, taking a lot of that content off the homepage uh, in order to provide a maybe one or two clear, very clear alternatives to the, the plethora of things that you can do on the homepage now in, in hopes that those things will be a little bit more uh, clear to people that there's, well, there's this, I can do this, or I can do this, or I leave. And how has that gone? Well, we're in the process of building it. So hopefully in the next month or so, we'll start testing it and, uh, and see if we're able to, to draw traffic away from the homepage by doing that. Okay. Historically, though, it, it has not been particularly effective. Let's talk about ads because yes. that is, um, well, I'm sure there's people on this podcast already screaming, why are you not talking about ads? <laughs> so what can you tell us about the, what can you tell us about your business in terms of ads? Like what's like, how, how is it structured on your site? You know, did you move around stuff? Like what, tell me everything you know about ads. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, for the longest time, the, a very the, the vast majority of the income from the, on the site has been uh, display ads. So we'll 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 talk about display ads uh, first. Um, for most people, uh, if you're looking for a simple solution, AdSense is probably a phenomenal set it and forget it. If they accept you, 
you can very easily, I want an ad here, I want an ad here, this size, that size, and move on and you'll get, uh, if, if you're in a vertical that has advertisers, you should get uh, a fair amount of revenue or a good, a good revenue earning on those ads. Um, there have been a number of things that have happened in the, in the last few years that of products that can compete against AdSense. That if people are using uh, a platform called DFP, Double Click for Publishers, I think Google has now just recently renamed it Google Ads. Um, I think that's what they've renamed the platform or Google Ad Manager, one of the two. And it's, it's a platform where you can load in uh, a bunch of different networks that would pay you by, uh, you know, I know that this network pays me about a thousand, a dollar per thousand impressions. So I'll compete against, set it to compete against AdSense for this rate. Um, that was, had been the model for a number of years. Uh, there's a newer technology called header bidding that has come into play that allows a, a little bit of competition to happen in the browser uh, and in the the ad servers on the ad server side to be able to service some of those higher paying ads to compete against AdSense. So you might have an ad network that I'm looking for, someone in Southern California who's this age range, and we know that this IP address represents that person or based on their cookies, and we're willing to spend a ton of money to get an ad in front of this person. And if that can surface up and compete against AdSense, you can you can make an extra 20 or 30% on your display revenue by implementing a, a variety of header bidder partners. And there's usually a limit that uh, kind of that six to eight partners that are compete that bring competition in against your existing display ads. Um, so double click. So I am by no means a, a an ad expert. So uh, I'm certainly probably going to come from this from the same angle as, as part of as someone in the audience. Mm -hmm. So from what I'm hearing is that there's two there's two types of ad technology really. So you've got double click, which is competing for the I guess it's the ad inventory. I think you mentioned, mm -hmm. and then uh, so they're trying to basically compete on who's going to perform, who's going to just show up there. Uh, yeah. And then you've also got this other type of technology, which you're saying is, is newer called header bidding, which is a smarter type of uh, ad placement that looks at the person's specific um, attributes, like, you know, where their IP address is located, their, their, their sex and, and stuff like that. Uh, it, and and that is that allows them to that allows the advertiser to to warrant paying a higher dollar amount. Is that yeah, am I getting yeah, this all correct? It, it's probably more based on cookies. So the ad network has seen this type of person, and so we're willing to pay for someone who's who we've cookied before. You could think of it like maybe it's a little bit of retargeting is in there. But yeah, they have demographics that they can tell based on your IP address, the likelihood that you are X, Y, or Z. You know, if you've if you visited a bunch of sites all run by the same ad network, so it has the same ad network on it, they see you going from site to site and are able to say, oh, gosh, this guy's been on a lot of sites about cameras. We might be able to, you know, categorize that. And if we have advertisers that are looking for people who have who have a, a predisposition for buying camera products, we're going to be more willing to put a camera ad in front of that person, regardless of whether the site they're on is about dogs or it's about cameras. That's actually a good thing to note because that was a huge shift in the way that the advertisements worked was because before you would go to, um, yeah, like, you know, you, every time you're doing your keyword research, you'd see, okay, well, there's this, this is the, uh, this is the, the CPC for this, yep. uh, for this niche, we'll call it. So then people would go towards that to build their sites. Whereas now it's different because it's really kind of this remarketing style of, of ads. Yeah, and, and that hurt me a lot in the long uh, in the early days because there weren't people that were like, "Hey, we want to target people that are doing looking up their IP address," and because it was a technical site, there wasn't you know there the yeah, you know there weren't ads for, "Hey, do you want to buy a a Cisco switch?" <laughs> you know, and, and so for me even though I could write content, it didn't necessarily do very well in terms of the ads until the more recent ad technology that's come out, come about with, um, you know, behavioral targeting of the user versus 
just targeting ads based on the site that it's on. Is is what is my IP address being? Is it are you making ad revenue based on clicks? Or are you making ad revenue based on impressions? You know, these days I don't know that you ever really know how you're being paid. Um, it's 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 all really going to be transparent um, in the back end because does it really matter if I'm getting paid twenty dollars per thousand impressions or if I'm getting paid twenty dollars for a single impression that happened a thousand you know one click that happened a th- uh, that you know one click that took a thousand impressions. Um, I don't know that it necessarily makes sense to chase. I mean, I definitely see a lot of people doing that. They're chasing the the, the earnings per click. And, and they're writing content, kind of like the, the mesothelioma uh, example, that people are trying to chase that that click. But I think a lot more advertisers are moving towards the uh, buying intent and things like that that make click and impression a little bit more vague. So we're talking about kind of this ad technology, but do you have, well, at least one from, from what I gather, so header bidding, that's just a type of technology. So mm-hmm. do, are you, do you have a preferred ad network that you like using? Um, so there's a couple that I've worked with over the years. I think the one I'm currently with, um, I, I, I ultimately ended up switching to a managed solution called Freestar. They manage all the relationships. So there's less, I don't have to worry about 15 different vendors that I'm billing and they have different payment terms and, different relationships that have to be managed. And I've got, you know, 15 reps that I've got to keep happy as opposed to just working with one person over at Freestar. Um, There's a number of uh, platforms that allow that multiple, multiple vendor integration. Uh, Sovereign S O V R N has a good platform. App Nexus has a good platform as well as uh, index exchange. Those are probably the big three kind of in the header bidding space where they allow, they'll provide, a fairly simple uh, series of code edits that you can provide, put on your site. Here's where I want my ads. And then as you work in to build new relationships with new header bidding partners, there's just a little bit of upkeep in terms of mapping vendors to ad spaces and things like that. It's just, it's usually not too technical. Hmm. So there is a certain bit of work really to to do all this. It's not this... I would imagine, you know, a lot of people, at least in our audience, are working with MediaVine most of the time or, um, you know, Media.net or AdThrive and, and things like that, uh, which I think is a bit of a more of like a managed solution, which sounds yeah, some, something Yeah, similar. in some sense it is a man. Those are managed solutions. Okay. And, and these days, they, they those people probably are pulling in header bidding as part of their platform. Um, ultimately, people just kind of need to, t- to to test on a regular basis to figure out what works best for them. And definitely ad networks. Uh, up until I switched to the managed solution, there was one ad network that I'd worked with for over 10 years, but everybody else had their have their peak and valleys. And if you're not moving out of them when they're having their valley, you're, you're leaving money on the table. Hmm. And so those are things you just kind of have to watch and test to make sure that you know, partner A is still doing good or partner B, hey, they're doing a little bit better. I need to work with them a little bit more and this other person a little bit less. So by peaks and valleys, are you saying in terms of their own ad, re- ad inventory that they can supply on your site? Is that is that what you mean? Yeah, and I think it's some of it is just depending on the contracts that they're, they're the, the advertisers that they're able to sell ad space to. Um, if their sales department is on fire, you might be getting paid out more because they have, uh, it depends on what you're looking at, supplier demand, which depending on which side of the equation you're on, define supply and demand. But if if they've got a lot of avatar, a lot of advertisers that are just hungry for inventory, that's naturally just going to ultimately get you paid more. But if their sales team is not doing so hot this quarter or this year, the, the amount of advertisers that are looking for that ad space is lower and you're going to make less money. And you kind of never really know other than watching your numbers kind of where that's happening. It's very interesting too, because um, at least in, in, in our, on our end, you know, we are mostly in the affiliate space. So to hear more about all the workings that are going on in the ad side, it's, I mean, 
it sounds like it might even be more complicated because right. there's way more like way more handshake deals basically going on. Yeah, it, there, there's definitely things that can be a lot more complicated and, and things that can be a lot easier in some respects. Uh, it's just it's it's a different game. It's a different process, and the display ad markets going through a uh, you know the last couple of years have been you know, lots of new technology, and you know everybody has been coming into the space. Oh, we've got this now. We've got this now. We've got this now. And so there's a lot of players. There'll probably be some massive consolidation in the next couple of years, down to three or four people or three or four companies, hopefully. Uh, have you found that those, have you found that this shift and this evolution in, in, in ads to be a benefit to you? Um, I think at times it's been a benefit, at times it's been a detriment. Um, I think if you're not keeping up with the technology, the technology shift's gonna hurt you uh, because you're now behind the curve. You're not kind of, you're not uh, putting into practice best practices now. And so that can hurt you. Um, for me, I think for for my vertical and the type of site that I've had, it has been very beneficial for me. It's really helped me to see display revenue growth when lots of other people are talking about, oh, we're just getting less and less money per impression, or it's just getting harder and harder to have more, you know, uh, to, to get more revenue. And so you're seeing things like these sites that have three sentences on it and 16 ads. <laughs> Hmm. It's like, well, I need to make more money, so I'm just going to slap one more ad on the page. Well, I'm just going to slap one more ad on the page, and at some point, it's more of the landscape is is about is about ad space than it is about content. And you're like, why did I even come to this page? That actually happened to me yesterday. I went onto a website, uh, and it was kind of like one of it was something to do with coffee. So basically, you go on there and. Uh, yeah, it looked like it was honestly, it was decent content, except mm -hmm. when I got there, they've got the banner at the bottom there. And then they've got a video that comes down kind of like a light box there. But behind that video, they also have an e like an email, uh, you know, uh, email lead box, basically. Mm -hmm. So there's, <laughs> there's three things, I right? Yeah. That. I got to close that. <laughs> I just left. <laughs> And that's ultimately what a site operator's got to got to look at is is the low engagement you have on site because you're chasing people away from your good content, or you know it's really finding that balance between keeping your revenue where it needs to be and serving your visitors. I mean, if you chase all your visitors away, it doesn't matter how many ads you have on your page or how profitable those ads are, if they're not willing to come to your site, it's irrelevant. Is time on page uh, like uh, what? What kind of engagement metrics would you be analyzing? I mean, I think you have to kind of, you know, every site I think is going to be a little bit different, but I think you're always looking to engage, uh, looking to increase your time on site for visitors and reduce your bounce rate. Um, in most industries, that's kind of what that works. In, in some sense, I'm not sure that that necessarily applies to what is my address.com. Because if you hit the homepage and you get exactly what you want and you leave, that's a success. So, but in a lot of content sites, the more time that you spend on the site is a, is a sign of engagement. You can run heat maps, seeing how far people are scrolling down on your page. What are they clicking on? What are they poking at? Okay, how can I change up my content, adding videos, adding imagery, bold, italics, different colors, just to kind of keep users engaged as they're scrolling down the page. I guess, yeah, when you're dealing with a site with tons of traffic, which we never really went over actually. So I think you're making, you're doing about a million, a million visitors a month. Is that correct? Uh, or... It's uh, 6 million visitors a month. Six X that. So yes. <laughs> it's a lot of traffic. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's switch gears and let's talk about affiliate, uh, um, affiliate offers. So how much of your revenue is from affiliate content uh, versus your your overall ad revenue? So I, I just looked at it and prep for this call. It's about 65% display and 35% affiliate right now. Oh, so it's actually, it's fairly balanced in, in a way. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to get it to the point where it's 50-50. So I, if I turned off one or something happened or to you know happen on one channel or the other, it wouldn't be I wouldn't be losing more than half my revenue because of it. Just, What's, I, I like that. Don't put all your eggs in one basket philosophy. So I think a lot of your revenue is probably recurring. Is that correct? Your so your affiliate revenue. 
Um, you know, it, it depends on the partner. Some of them, uh, you know, I, I think I personally kind of prefer uh, ongoing revenue. You usually make less uh, per act, you know, less in any given integer of time. So if you might have a, a particularly aggressive CPA model that might pay you $50, but it's a one-time payment versus $5 a month for the life of the product. Um, for some affiliates, it's, it's a cash flow problem. If they're spending money driving traffic to the site, they need to actualize the, the, the full commission up front because they've got to pay, they've got an ad bill coming due. Um, it's one of the dangers of affiliate, you know, marketing in the affiliate space is watching cash flow. I, I personally think that like an ongoing, ongoing subscription model is ultimately best for everybody. Um, I think it, cause it puts uh, the website operators, uh, everybody's uh, experience is in alignment. If the user is happy and continue to use the product, everybody makes money. If the vendor is keeping their customers happy, then they're making money. If the website builder is producing content that keeps customers on the books because they're representing the product right, ultimately I think that works out in a better experience for you know the customer, the affiliate, and the advertiser. It all works out really well. You think you get into problems when you have really high CPA deals where let me just get them on the books and I don't care if they last as long as they, you know, make it past the cancellation period, I'm okay. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a dangerous place to be in as affiliates. I think when the advertisers are young, they're often looking to buy market share. And so they're willing to spend a lot, but at some point they start looking at their bottom line and going, we're paying this affiliate an awful lot of money, but his customers aren't staying on the books. So even if we're paying it all up front and lump, you know, and we're paying it all up front. So we're, gee, when we look at the numbers, we're actually losing money with this affiliate. Let's just cut them off entirely. Yeah, for sure. It, being an affiliate has a lot to do with relationships with yes. your, with your partners and with your vendors. Yeah. And, and your users also, you have to represent the products appropriately to your users and, your users trust you in that recommendation. Did you do, uh, did you do keyword research at the beginning when you started building out this uh, affiliate content side of your site? Uh, initially, no, I didn't do keyword keyword research. It was just a couple of people in the a couple of vendors in the online privacy and security space approached me and said, "Hey." we have a product that we think would do well with your audience. So it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't great forethought on my end that resulted in my entrance into this space, but you know, it was advertiser driven saying, Hey, we have a product that we think would work really well here. Can we test it? Can we try it? I tried it and it's like, Oh, I can make some good money doing this. Let me start building. Let me start working on building out content to talk about all aspects of these products and services. And it's 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 why it's now thirty five percent affiliate revenue versus you know five or ten percent. Mm -hmm. What can you share about your whole experience writing um, affiliate content for for the site? Are there any tips or anything like that that you can share with people? You know, one of the things I'm I'm kind of surprised that more that in talking with other affiliates that they don't do is. Uh, go to your affiliate. If you're a good affiliate for them, go to them and ask them, what should I be writing about? What converts, what type of content converts well for your customers? And uh, some, some people will, some of the advertisers will even produce content for you. Um, I would take that with a grain of salt. I've had a number of my partners write content that is absolutely horrible, uh, wrong voice and just, Oh my gosh, that's just a bunch of gobbledygook. No one will understand what that means. But I've had other other uh, advertisers write content that has been some of my best performing content for them. So it's, you know, you need to trust that they know their space and ask them about it and say, hey, what should I be writing about? What, you know, what, what do you think I am missing out on? You know, most affiliate managers want to have that back and forth relationship. They're looking for an affiliate that wants to grow the business. And asking them, well, how can I grow the business? What do you think I could do better? You know, 
they have the advantage of they're coming from the position of they see all their affiliates and they know, well, this guy's doing this and it's working really well. This guy's doing this and it's working really well. You're doing this and eh, it's, it's working okay. You know, and so they'll have a, they can generally offer some really good insights as to where you might be, where you should be potentially putting some more focus where you're not. Awesome. Yeah. I haven't, uh, haven't heard that one yet and haven't tried that one yet in terms of asking the, asking the manager or getting, getting their feedback on topics because they have, Oh, they can see a lot more than you. Yeah. In terms they they, they, what, they uh, definitely have a bigger picture than, than us as an affiliate have. Uh, but I also think it's, it's also a matter of, you know, if you, if there are multiple, programs within the same vertical, you know, company A, company B, company C, is not putting all your eggs in one basket. Um, I've definitely found over the years that, you know, there's a, there's a lot that goes into conversion rates outside of your control. Um, sometimes they make changes on their site that help. Sometimes they make stuff that hurts. Um, they have TV campaigns, which can hurt or help depending on how you look at it. And sometimes popularity of particular brand names ebb and flow as well. Um, you know, most of the uh, affiliates, uh, affiliate programs that I'm currently running in the online privacy and security vertical are not the ones that I initially started with. Those ones have just not performed as well over time. And so it's always good to, to you know, to watch performance, to have some level of A-B testing in there where you're knowing, well, gee, with this particular vendor, I'm making X dollars per page view or X dollars per click that number starting to trend down. Let me look at someone who's trending up and replacing them. And so it's, you know, when you have multiple vendors in the same space, you can sometimes swap stuff out almost one for one. Other times you have to rewrite content or write new content that talks specifically about the speeds and feeds of that particular vendor. But a lot of vendors are can often be interchangeable. So a lot of our audience is... Uh, in the Amazon space, I would say. So, you know, they're reviewing these physical products. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I mean, I think that's just mostly because, well, Amazon is is a beast. So, you know, they, they, they've they got 40% uh, of all U.S. e-commerce. Yeah. But <laughs> there are other affiliate networks out there. And mm -hmm. those are the ones that you're probably on. So do you have any, do you have any ones that you, that you prefer? Um, there's commission. I don't know if people have heard of commission junction, cj.com, uh, impact radius. It's more of a platform, uh, get informational products on, uh, like, uh, ClickBank. Um, I'm generally looking more for the uh, direct relationships with my vendors. And that's probably another thing that, that people can look at doing is if you're currently working through commission junction, to work with a with a particular vendor, if you're doing really well with them, you might want to see if you can go direct to them, and make a little bit more commission. So I, I generally try to do dr uh, direct relationships because I just you know the the people at any particular ad network are going to have less experience about offering me how to grow my business as opposed to the the company directly. Okay, okay, those are that's good advice. I want to switch gears again and I want to talk about SEO though. So be mm -hmm. like SEO is a very is quite competitor for you. I mean, you mentioned that that there's some black hat sites that ended up outranking you and your your main competitor. What tips can you share about SEO given given how competitive it is? Uh don't don't take shortcuts. <laughs> That's probably the biggest thing is, you know, if you think it's shady or it looks like it might be shady, don't do it. It's not worth, you know, a, any short term, you know, short term value that you get out of, hey, let me go to okay, old, old, old technique. Let me, let me go to forums and, you know, sign up for a bunch of forums and put my the link to my site and my, you know, in my signature and, and post lots of content in forums. You know, that worked for a while. But sites that had that as the predominant source of their links eventually got slapped and it hurt them in the long run. So I think it's about, you know, good practices, uh, identifying user intent. Why is the person coming to my page? Or if I'm, if I'm looking for someone, you know, what, what, 
what what where's where's their journey? Are they just starting to learn out about the product, or are they now in the point where I'm about ready to buy and I'm making comparison between products or I'm ready to buy and writing content for those specific places in the journey, making sure that your keywords match that place in the journey, that your your page titles, the thing the description and searches match where the person is in their journey. What are they trying to do that you're trying to where where are you trying to get that get at them in your journey? If you get the wrong one, then there's a mismatch and it won't be as effective. That is why I love SEO is because regardless of the fact that we are essentially trying to work with this machine, it really is about zooming out and taking a look at what the actual user is yeah. going through in their journey. And, and that's what I've, I mean, with writing content for what is my address, we've always, you know, looked at it from the, what is, you know, it's, it's about the user. Is this helpful to the user, right? For the user perspective, I'm not writing for a search engine. I'm not writing for a bot. I'm writing for user experience. Every, you know, working really hard to think about user experience. And um, for us, that's a, for me, that served me well over the last 20 years. Awesome. Um, I know we're running out of time here. I do have two more questions for you. Sure. The one question is, if you have any final tips on CRO, maybe bang them out. Let, me, let the audience know. Conversion rate optimization. Yeah, yes. conversion rate optimization is not something that I've spent a lot of time on, but the, everything that I've read and heard and listened to people talking about, it, it's it's try, 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 always be integrating. You know, Start with someone looking, someone looking at someone whose site is successful, copy what they've done, and then just slowly iterate different variables through the process. Awesome. Uh, the final question is really just, it's really up to you. So uh, do you have any final bits of advice or anything like that that you want to share with the audience before we go? I think, you know, you, you talked about, um, you know, deciding what to write about based off of, you know, people have done it based off of chasing the money. I think if you're going to do it long term, it has to be something that you're interested in. Uh, you know, you talked about having, making sure that other people can, you, know, you can outsource the writing about it. But if it's something that you're not interested in, I don't think it, uh, in the long run, you're going to be able to hang on. I think one of the reasons why my site has done well is because it's, it's a topic that's interested in me. I'm a, a geeky tech person. And so it's been easy for me to think of content ideas. I'm familiar with the topics. Um, so I think you're, the familiarity and the joy that you get from what you do helps when you have a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, Chris, well, thank you for coming on to the, uh, the Human Proof Designs broadcast here. Uh, and well, I guess that is pretty much it for the end of the episode. And we'll see everybody next week. Thank you much. Had a great time.